So it's going to be a two against one scenario. Rodell and Patrick both truly believe in rap. Me, Joe Basha, your humble host, <laughs> really thinks the only rap that should exist, and even Robbie should even exist, is the rap that you hear from Eminem or Jay Z. So or Nate with, Dog. Nate with, Dog. And Nate Dog. <laughs> Nate Dog. Nate. That's Nathan Bader's <laughs> name is Nate Dog. So with that said, let's let the argument begin. Rodell, Patrick, which of you chooses to go first? I'll go first. You're going first, okay? So we're going with Patrick. All right. So Patrick, you're so, on. So uh, I, because what we're talking about here is the difference between hemoconcentration and rap. Uh, I think that rap is better in the in the reason that think about some of the things that come off in the ultra filtration process. Uh, there's heparin, some heparin. Uh, there's heparin. plasma free heparin, which and you know a lot about because yeah. you wrote a paper on it. Exactly. Um, there are there are inflammatory response you know mediators, pieces, yeah. mediators that come out, and so that that's a good thing. Um, but in general, if you're just simply taking fluid off of your circuit before you go on bypass, I think you're better off than 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 taking off a bunch of other stuff that you've got to replace. And that's that's where I stand. I mean, I, I, I've seen over and over when I go on bypass that RAP is, is very helpful. And I will go as far as to say that it's worth the risk to do arterial RAP, which we can talk about some of the situations we've seen in our practice, right. and venous RAP, because I know there's dangers to arterial RAP. Mm -hmm. Now, just in case anybody is watching the program that doesn't know what RAP is, and I probably should have explained that to yeah. start with. So w when you have a heart-lung machine set up, in case anybody's not a perfusionist, you have to prime it. You don't want to have air in the system for obvious reasons. And the, the, the minimum is probably about 1,000 cc's. 1,000 to, it could be 1,000 up to 2,000 cc's, depending on the person's circuit. Would you agree with Absolutely. that? Absolutely. 1,000 is... Get get a liter off is what you're saying. No, a no to prime, the, to prime the circuit. Oh, to prime okay. non blood sure. of non blood product. Yeah, and as a result of that, the, if you go on bypass when you when you when you turn that circuit on, the patient receives that liter of fluid and dilutes their blood, but then it all mixes and all that kind of thing. If you do wrap, then you will flush the system with the patient's blood and sort of, I had a diagram of it, but for whatever, I can't show you the little video with the techno technological failure on my part, but it will flush that with the patient's blood forwards and backwards before you go on bypass. And that reduces the, well, that just eliminates that liter of fluid. Okay. So that's what that is. So Rodell. Right. So. You know, before I came here, I was I was rapping for most of my career. You know, that first year I didn't do rapping because you know it's sometimes it's it's tough for a new grad to you know grasp the gravity of the situation or understand the you know the teamwork that that needs to be involved in rap. Um, but I'd been doing it for 15 years uh, with great results. Um, you know, we're using that patient's volume to push that 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 uh, crystalloid back, and and thus, you know, uh, reducing hemodilution. And that's what my talk is. You know, we're going to talk about that later in one of my other uh, discussions. But uh, I found a couple articles um, that were quite interesting um, this morning because you know I was doing this on the fly. I'm sorry, Nate. But, uh, you know, this is on the Brazilian Journal of Cardiovascular Surgery, and it, uh, it, it talks about the efficacy of, of retrograde autologous priming in the, in the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit. Um, let's see. And, uh, you know, and it resulted in, in something quite interesting. You know, we talk about, you know, the you know, significant values um, and if you see here, the hemoglobin values did not differ between uh, the RAP group and the non-RAP group. But what was interesting was uh, the hemoglobin, excuse me, the, uh, during cardiopulmonary bypass, the hemoglobin values and the hematocrit values were significantly increased in the RAP group than the control group, which is the non-RAP group, which is just the crystalloid group. Um, so that was quite interesting. Um, you know, you can point with this oh, too, if you want to. Very nice. So, oh, maybe that's not on. 
on. Maybe it's not on. It's not working. That's okay. The joys of, of live TV. And, and you know, that, that was quite interesting to me. Um, and then I found this other paper. It's, it's again, talking about the efficacy of, of, of rap. Um, let's see. And I just have I just have a few I just have a few uh, charts here. Um, Can you read it? Yeah, my eyes aren't so good since I've turned forty, but <laughs> nonetheless, I, I can read I can read most of it. And hopefully, you can see it while while you're uh, viewing this on the web. Um, it, maybe not statistical um, values that are, that that are just eye popping, but you know, in the control group for me. 24 hour chest tube drainage is a big deal because that, that equates to transfusions. You know, it, 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 the surgeon looks at like, hey, what did you do back there? What did, what did you do to my patient? Did you give him blood? Why, why didn't you do this or do that? So, I mean, that, that, that's, that's 100 mLs of, of volume that, that got out of the patient. So, th and that could very well translate to a lower hemoglobin and thus getting a pack cell. And we'll talk about the deleterious effects of pack cells in my next talk. But that was quite interesting. Um, patients in the control group were transfused more. I mean, look at, if you see there, there's a, there's a 24 uh, versus a nine in the rap group. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was quite significant to me. And you know, not that this is a huge amount. Uh, patients transfused with other blood products, not just your your, your RBCs, your FFP, and your platelets, because we're also talking about increasing your colloid osmotic pressure by not hemodiluting them. I mean, you're you're, you're diluting your albumin, you're diluting your. That's a good point. Yeah, you're diluting your inotropic drugs, you're diluting heck in. I'm sure that some of you out there are actually priming with mannitol, with heparin, you know, your bicarbs. And if you're not hemodiluting those drugs in your prime, you would think that it would have more efficacy if you're not diluting those drugs. You're not pulling those off. <laughs> you so, try, are you trying so, to convince me? So I am are trying you, to convince you, you because, <laughs> because I have 15 years worth of experience with RAP. Because, you know, RAP was... Was not was is considered controversial, mm. you know, with with, with a with a group of perfusionists. I mean, actually, with with most perfusionists, you know, when we when I go to conferences and we talk about rap, we're like, oh my goodness, you rap? Why do you do that? There's just an insignificant amount of volume that's taken off. It's not insignificant, but it's not ex you, insignificant. You can get, we, we can get 700 cc's off yes. if we do it well. If mm -hmm. you do it well, 700 cc's. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Mm -hmm. And there, there's I can't some, wait to hear your side. Yes, so so it's quite interesting too, and it's it's almost a, an issue with, with with how you communicate with your team. Like, it, well, I do hear well, anesthesia just gives it right back. You know, there. I mean, yeah. w this 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 hypovolemia, this hypotension. Well, we can do that, but we can also mediate it with phenylephrine which is what we did a lot of. Mm -hmm. I mean, the surgeon, if the surgeon, if you talk to the surgeon and say like, hey, I'm just wrapping, he goes, okay, not a problem, just bump them up. I mean, I heard that a lot. And that gives us that, that autonomy, it gives us, hey, that communication with, with that anesthesiologist or CRNA. <laughs> so so that, that's a quite interesting thing. And I am, trying to take care of this patient from inception till when they discharge. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just looking at this bypass run with RAP. I'm taking this volume away from this patient so they don't have to see that hemodilution. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to take or get red blood cells, you know, whole blood, cryo, all these different types of, of, of homologous blood that is hopefully unnecessary. And I think, let's see. So, and then we, we look at this, and, and this is quite interesting. You know, you, you look at, um, and what, what do we see here? 
my eyes aren't so good. Exactly. You're right. You're right. Exactly. <laughs> you could watch it on your computer too, I, so you could actually see yeah. it. Yeah, that's very good. That's a good point. Um, but again, it, it's quite interesting where where we do get to talk to the talk to our team mm -hmm. about rap. So so it's just another piece of you know this surgery that we can talk about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So and it I'd like opens to weigh up in the on that too. And, and, oh yeah, you know, we're gonna we're gonna be weighing in on this for a little while here. Well, I think so. But yeah, you go first. No, 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 okay. no. Okay. So uh, I got two points I want to bring up. The second one I'll save for later. But um, it's pretty impressive when you can when you got a patient who's say eighty kilograms and they've uh, come into the OR with a crit of twenty seven, and you can say to the surgeon. I got this. We're not going to use any blood. We're good. And if you think about this, this is really the argument. Well, we'll figure out what the argument is here if you're going to come down on the side of hemo concentration. But as far as uh, as far as wrap goes, let's say let's say we wrap and we go on and our immediate hematocrit right away because we wrapped is say 20 as opposed to 15 or 16. <clears throat> When you hemoconcentrate, it's going to take you, even at the fastest rate, it's going to take you two or three minutes to get, get that, you know, that volume off, to get that crit back up. If you go on and it's suddenly at 16, you're going to get back up to 20. Mm -hmm. So what happens during that three minutes as far as to the brain? And that's something that, that I mean, you know, that's why I would say RAP is better than hemoconcentration because of the immediate uh, effect that we're going to have on the, he on the, the hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Answer that. <laughs> now, did He's you, holding back. He's so, do you have any more? No, I mean, so, so slides, we're right? so we're so we're showing this graph, and we're, we're showing we're showing the difference, you know, with with the hematocrit during the, during the whole bypass run, and even hematocrit at discharge. You know, we see we see that graph where you know the the preop hematocrit is the same, obviously, because we're not on bypass, and then there's the pre Pre bypass, it's it's fairly close. I mean, you know, you get some hemodilution because you know the anesthesia has to give their their meds through mm. through their IVs, and then and then you you go through the pump run after after the wrap, and you actually see the post CPB hematocrit go up, mm -hmm. probably because you know what we didn't have that you know, that volume that was given. I mean, and hopefully, hopefully that perfusionist or, or th this group was judicious in, in, in the, the volume administration. Yeah, and, and uh, good point, but let me just ask you, is that, to, that control, I mean, I can't quite read all of it, but mm -hmm. just so we understand it, we're all on the same page here, that's comparing it to non-wrap, non -wrap, but non -wrap. not ultrafiltration. Correct. That's not, the, these, these comparisons you're doing are not with ultrafiltration. Right, correct. They're just a control, no wrap, no wrap. versus wrap. Right. Okay, fair enough. But, you know, I'm just showing you that, like, hey, you know, it's, it's a viable technique within the perfusions toolbox. Yeah, I'm really curious um, out there uh, if anybody could send it via chat or hopefully people will call in. Um, I want to get y'all's opinion about this too and know whether you use RAP within your practice or whether you just use ultrafiltration within your practice. I'm really pretty curious about that. So make sure you do either chat or call in. And oh, one other thing I forgot to mention, we're dual streaming over not just YouTube, but Facebook. I forgot to mention oh, that right. in the opening Facebook remarks. Live. So we're actually on Facebook Live right now as well. In fact, it's being watched. Um, so that's perfect. I forgot to mention that. But so just so everybody's on the same page who's watching, this is not comparing it to anything but either I'm rap sure or nothing. Correct. Okay. Correct. Well, I, I, did, I couldn't find anything that was, that was, you know, that was really a comparative with hemo, with uh, hemo concentration and, and rap. Because you know what? It, it, we also talk about with that lack of volume, quote unquote, we may not have that volume the hemoconcentrate. You know, we've taken we've taken that patient's volume back and you know we don't have that mm. that extracellular Oh those are those are the special cases when yes. in particular when I really disagree with rap and I'll ah. explain that too. Yes. 
So uh, did you have any other slides? No, I, think, I believe that's, that's it. it. Those, that's the end yeah, of your slides. That's the end of my slides. We could do a study on that. Or we could do a quick a study group, on it. I would love to do that. Actually. Actually. Well, between, you know what, I would we could welcome. compare RAP and uh, hemoconcentration and mm -hmm. do a study. We could do that. I think that would be outstanding. And I think if it, it just isn't about blood transfusions. It's about, you know, all kinds of things. Renal failure. It's about, you know, uh, length of uh, intubation time. It's about stay in the ICU. Right. It's about post-operative bleeding. It's about length of time in the hospital as a whole, um, not just, you know, transfusions. So mm -hmm. what impact is all of this going to have? And I think, you know, the way I, the way I view this whole thing is that it's a risk to benefit ratio. You're going to open your venous line and you're going to drain blood back. You might do arterial line first and you're going to drain blood back. It doesn't matter which direction we choose to go first, but both of those are fraught with, in my opinion, potential pitfalls and dangers. Um, you can take off too much volume at any one time, something could happen. I mean, likelihood is probably slim, but it could. I've seen people wrapping through the arterial retrograde, personally know the experience. It wasn't me, because I, I, I won't do it, but they actually entrained air around the purse string right. sutures and got <clears throat> air in the arterial cannula by retrograde priming the arterial line. You talked about a patient that you might not have enough volume in which to ultrafiltrate, but yet you're going to now drain that patient of all of that pump circuit and you have to involve anesthesia, giving Neo, the blood pressure is probably going to go down and they're going to get it back up again. But you were worried about my two or three minutes to get my prime off. But in the two or three minutes that you're doing that and you're pushing Neo and you're artificially creating a blood pressure with terribly inadequate perfusion, how could that be any better? Now, you go on pump and you have, let's say, a, 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 a bit of hypovolemia and you, or, or let's say in your scenario, you go on and you diluted the hematocrit a little more than you wanted to. You can flow that. It's about O2 delivery. So when you talk about draining this patient of 25% of their blood volume, potentially up to right. maybe 30, depending on the patient, maybe only 20, depending on the patient, then I think that what happens is we have no idea what's happening. We're not monitoring TCD. True. You don't know that the cerebral perfusion pressure is adequate. Anesthesia can give anybody a blood pressure, but we all know, and I don't mean to be redundant or repeat myself, Blood pressure and perfusion are not equal. You can have a great blood pressure and no perfusion whatsoever. So for me, it becomes a risk to benefit ratio. What is the risk of potentially hypoperfusing the patient and what will the effect of that be by draining that blood to displace the pump prime versus going on potentially having <clears throat> a lower than we're comfortable with hematocrit and within two or three minutes ultrafiltrating off that prime. One seems inherently much more safe than much safer than the other. So how do you address my concern about that? Because, uh, you know, and, and I make no bones about this. I am 100 and a billion percent against wrapping anybody. Even the venous side. Even the venous side, completely because, against it. Because, you know, you don't have the risks of uh, entraining air on the venous side. Right. I mean, you, you, you can entrain air if you do that, but it's not going to be a serious problem for the mm -hmm. patient. Uh, I think there are some inherent risks on the arterial side. Uh, you got to make sure you do it right. Don't leave your vacuum mm -hmm. <laughs> on when you do mm -hmm. that and, you know, mm -hmm. do it slowly, that sort of thing. But... Um, I think the venous side, you know, our, in our circuit, our, our venous side is 300 milliliters. That's what it is. And uh, that's, that's worth it to get it off. And, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. What I do is uh, I hope none of the anesthesiologists that, or surgeons that we work with are watching this right now. But what I do if I'm going to wrap, if I've got that patient who's, you know, 80 kilograms, 70 kilograms, and they already have a low hematocrit, is I'll put a little little bit of neosinephrine in the prime mm -hmm. so that when I wrap and the minute I go on, you know, they're pushing that volume back to me. And mm -hmm. I think it helps. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, you So know, do you think it's better to have 
in, in all seriousness, a hematocrit of 17 or 16, hopefully not that low, but I guess it could happen, for two or three minutes, or is it better to have an SVR of 3,000 for six for I don't have an SVR minutes? that low because I've already, no, I've already hit them with some neosinephrine. 2,000, that high. Normal's about 1,000, so yeah. I'm just doubling it. But I don't really have a low SVR already because I've already hit them with some neosinephrine in the prime. So the second I go on, their SVR is back up. Okay, but if I'm you're not taking waiting three minutes blood to out of them. a patient, what is the normal physiologic reaction to the to the to the arterial circulation? It const, it constricts, right? Sure. So your SVR is already going up because you're taking volume out. Right, right. So then, if you go on with Neo, now your SVR is even higher. So my question is, what's better, giving a vasopressor and raising the SVR to twice normal, or having a little bit lower hematocrit for 15, 16, even for two or three minutes. I mean, that's my fundamental question. Yeah, it's, uh, there's no way to tell because like you said, we're not really Does it monitoring. give you pause? Does it make you concerned? Um, but do you know? If you don't know. I, I don't know what happens. But yeah, it's true, we don't you, know. We but don't does know. that give you pause? It's a good argument. Are you rethinking <laughs> your position? Uh, I'd have to have some sort of concrete Evidence, but are which you is another study. your position? Okay, yes, I'm doing okay, that. Okay, well, my job. I'll, I'll give you my that. Work <laughs> my work is done here. I, my, I, in right. fact, I can retire. No, I, I, I think, feel no, like you I can retire. retire for perfusion now. I'm done. <laughs> done. I have, I have, I have converted Patrick. You did not convert me. I said I was, okay. I was rethinking so, my position, <laughs> but I'm not changing. No, not yeah. yet. I, okay. I would need. This is a great study, but we'd have to have. You know, we'd have to have some additional monitoring. And I think mm -hmm. it'd be a very good study to have. Stephanie yeah. has a chat. She says, I have to take my glasses off to read it. In low volume, small patients, I've seen that you can get the 700 off with wrap, but you can't always get that same amount off with hemoconcentration Correct. after you go on. Oh. Yes. So oh. This, is, this, is oh. Oh. No, this is where I'm coming from. <laughs> So we talk about what we're trying to accomplish. What, I mean, we, we run the heart-lung machine. You know, we're gonna isolate away from the lungs and the mm -hmm. heart, correct? So when we have this crystalloid volume and we're not wrapping, we're not taking it off, we immediately push it into the lungs. So it's true, correct? I mean, we're actually pushing this, this this, this non-heme component in straight into the lungs. And we're not going to get it back unless we have some sort of well, colloid osmotic. Straight into the lungs. I was going to ask what that I'm question saying myself. Is, what I'm yeah, saying you know, is what? it's getting absorbed into the lungs. I mean, it's so got the largest surface. It's got the largest. Spacing. Yes. We're third. So because of the, yes. because of the increased hema dilution, we're third spacing. We are third spacing and into the increasing lungs. pulmonary and, and, and causing pulmonary edema. Correct, okay. and uh, that's my issue. I, I off um, of one liter off of, of, of fluid. But 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 if you think about it, we're I, we're again isolate where we've got like this ischemic type of lung, where we are not getting that circulation to that lung. We are we were oxygenating it. It's great. That's our job, but. How are we retrieving that afterwards? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just sitting there. If, we're, if we've got a cross clamp time or even a pump time of, of 90 minutes, that's 90 minutes of this lung just absorbing all of that crystalloid. How? So, the third space. I, I, are we, so if we're, if we're not increasing our colloid osmotic pressure by taking I mean, that, you know we're not pumping through it. We're not pumping through it, but it's just sitting there and it's, it, we're not we're not retrieving that, that, that blood back. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying so is we're third, it just sits in in the pulmonary vasculature yeah. and just leaks out over time, over the course of time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying, so you're saying, so, so, so I've we're, never heard that before. So we're you saying, know, so we're saying we're just prolonged vent times. Oh, potentially. Potential potentially. I, I would like, if it's possible, uh, Stephanie, if she's uh, still watching and if she could call in, I would really like it if she could do that because I want to know 
I want to understand why she thinks what she said. I mean, I, I'd like to hear about well, that let's more. Do, let's do this. Because I think it really speaks to what you're Roger, talking about. Could you go ahead and open the phone lines? That, like, do a, uh, uh, yeah. put a message on there that we're going to go ahead and open the phone lines. But uh, Kimberly Miller, our Kimberly Miller? Who's Kimberly Miller? She, is, that our, is, this, is this our Kimberly Miller? The Kimberly? Is, I don't know who Kimberly Miller is. I, I feel horrible Kimberly that about not knowing Miller. Herman. <laughs> so Kimberly Miller at, says that she believes in rap. Kimberly, call in, okay? Um, she believes in rap, but you need participation from anesthesia. And mm -hmm. I think that she's exactly right. That. It's definitely Absolutely. a team effort, that's to, for sure. It is a group effort. There's yep. no question that it requires, you know, Everybody in the room, the surgeon has to be a little bit patient. He can't be picking the heart up while you're trying to wrap. Yeah. He has to be patient and wait. Anesthesia right. has to be, you know, one, uh, of course, they have to be ready to give some Neo or something like that to help with the blood pressure. So they have to do that. But what do you think the probability is? the probability is that anesthesia, knowing what your technique is, we're all creatures of, you know, wanting to just make the case go as easy for and us as we as possibly as can, absolutely. okay? So we know that we're wrapping. How many do fluid restriction when the patient gets to the operating room and that they're not already way more than what you're gonna wrap off uh, uh, fluid loaded by anesthesia so that the wrap goes so much easier. Yeah. So are you only looking at it from a, hold on one second here, I'll have to swipe it. Good morning, you're on the air, how are you? Who's this? Good morning, Joe Baja, this is Stephanie Ebus. Hey Stephanie. From the Woodlands. Yes. Hey. So I just wanted to make a comment about what we were talking about with the um, wrap before we cross clamp. So I do believe that if you have a lower crit, a lower oncotic pressure when you first go on and you cross clamp right away, then that's what's going to sit in the lungs for that whole period of time of cross clamp. If you can have a higher oncotic pressure, higher hematic crit, I do think it's better for the lungs. Mm -hmm. So that's one point. Uh, one, uh, the second point I wanted to make, and then I'll let you guys comment. Um, you asked Patrick if he could say if it was better to have a low crit, like 16 or 17, or um, a higher SVR. I think he's right. We don't know about the higher SVR, but we do know having the lower hematocrit of 16 or 17 is bad for the patient. So I would argue that 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 is probably more important. Even transiently? Yes. Thank it's you, Stephanie. To, well, thank you. Why do I feel why do I feel like I'm being beat up on Well, here listen, today? I'll tell you, you because you already said rough. it was a two I, against one. I think one. that you are taking it's three a, against one now. Well. I think you're taking a position that's hard to argue. <laughs> yes. That's what I think. And I appreciate you're doing that because that's what this is about, is we need to have what we should do is. No, have I don't somebody think it's hard to argue at all. Frankly, I, I completely disagree with all right. of you about this. I mean, I, I'm not taking this position just for entertainment value. Right. No, you I'm really believe this it. position position okay. because I fundamentally believe that the downside risk potential of performing this RAP procedure far outweighs the downside risk potential to a transient. And it's not every patient that's going right. to have a hematocrit of 15. And if the patient is that anemic, where my liter of pump prime is going to knock their hematocrit down to 15 or 16, well, well, they're probably a really sick patient to start with anyway, somewhat unstable. I mean, I can make the same arguments here about these unusual cases responding to Stephanie's uh, concerns mm -hmm. is that, uh, you know, are you going to attempt to wrap a patient who is uh, who has an ejection fraction of 20 percent and uh, who is uh, on right. multiple pressors already? And you're trying to just, you know, do an, a, a, not 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 a coding situation, but yeah. a really sick patient. Yeah. Um, are you are, I, I'm just asking, I, Stephanie, would you wrap that patient? So the beauty of wrap is that you can stop at any moment. So you can start to wrap slowly, and if there is any pressure drop or the patient doesn't tolerate it, you can stop. Mm -hmm. And also, 
you can go on bypass right away. Right. So and that's I the, really don't think that I don't think at first when we started wrapping, we were very selective on patients. But then we started wrapping every patient because we found that if we did it slowly and we communicated with the anesthesia and the surgeon that there, there were no, no issues mm -hmm. because you can just stop wrapping if the pressure dropped. Right, right. So, so again, going back to this 20% ejection fraction patient and you're the, the very patient already anemic, the very patient that you really, for those of you who advocate for RAP, want to perform that procedure on and you can't and now you just go on bypass, what, what are you going to do at that point in time? So the well, sickest of the patients who have the least likelihood of, of successfully being able to wrap with, you, you, you become unstable and go on, and then, then, and then what do you do? Now, I'm just going to go I'm, around with everybody. But I'm saying that and, and rarely ultrafiltrate. ever happens. <laughs> but, but, okay, that rarely, exactly. So I think the same thing applies to my argument, is that I think that it rarely ever happens. The hematocrit is 15 or 16. Really, it's the difference between going on and having a hematocrit maybe of 30 versus a hematocrit of 26 or 27. Right. Is there really any difference between those two? And is that going to really cause all of these problems that everybody seems to think is going to occur with this liter of volume? You have a relatively healthy patient, no problems, minor little comorbidities, um, hematocrit of 38% before you go on bypass. Uh, wh where do you wh explain to me so I can understand how a hematocrit of 27 or 26 or 25 for two or three minutes while I remove that prime from the ultra filtrator has less risk and more and is more deleterious than you going through a two or three minute procedure of attempting to wrap uh, potentially having some instability with the blood pressure. I think much more risk of that, in my opinion, and then going on bypass and uh, doing the case with hematocrit of 30. I can make the hematocrit 30 in the amount of time it takes you to wrap the, uh, the circuit. So, so how is that better? Well, I think the point is that when you go on, you're giving that liter of fluid all in one shot, like in 30 seconds, they're getting a liter of fluid. And I don't think that is good. It's not like they're getting a liter of fluid over four hours, you know? Right. Well, I mean, that's true. That's true. Right. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever seen anesthesia try to give a rapid transfusion of, of normal saline at a liter unless they, Well, but know. that's because they'll go into cardiac failure. Correct. It's a closed system. We have an Correct. Open, we have an open system. <laughs> yeah, but we're have an open system. I mean, I don't think you can, can compare the two. I mean, we have a reservoir and we right. drain the heart. I mean, their reason for not giving volume that fast is because they would push the heart over the Starling curve and it would go into failure, but we don't have that concern. That can't happen to us. Well, I agree. But, but that is a fast dilution. Right. So are we kind of coming to that this is a patient selection? Would you agree to that? No, I, you think, know, that, that I think some patients a, should be wrapped and no, some frankly, patients should not. No, I think that if anything, I might be willing to advocate for something we used to do in the old days was mix. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with mixing or not, but this is something that we did as a precursor to sort of trying to figure out how we avoid this rush of fluid, but our circuits at the time were a minimum, bare minimum of 2,000 cc's of prime. Right. Actually, some of them were up to 2,500 yeah. cc's yeah. of prime. And we were trying to get away from blood and we would go on bypass with those cases and you would have like, you know, 30 seconds before you actually saw blood going right. through the line, uh, right. maybe even longer than that <laughs> yeah. sometimes. I so believe it. it That's was, a long 30 it was, seconds. Long right. 30 it was pretty, it, was, right. it wasn't good. So how, what we did in those circumstances, because we actually did see where it had an effect. And we would drain out the venous and pump in the arterial slowly and just keep doing that over the course of time. So, so we kept, kept the patient's blood volume normal, but only gave, or, or, or euvolemic, but only gave small aliquots of fluid until the blood was up to the arterial cannula. And then we would go on bypass. And we called that mixing. Uh, and uh, so mixing. The, was okay. this, okay, so it was close to hem, hem excuse me. The, uh, what do they call that? Uh, 
Isobiometric hemodilution, is that what we were talking about? Well, similar to that. Similar I think, to that? I think, I think, I think what you're talking, I think you're talking about when they drain, when they, when they take blood, the patient, put it in the bag, they, what are they, what, they have a term. Yeah, term we used to do that? that too. They call that, um, uh, that, what do they call Well, you, you salvage some blood from the venous line. Yeah, there's a term for it, but I'm not talking about. And you the case. About. But, yeah. Okay. but yeah, but basically that, that was the process that we used. But for a, a thousand cc's, you know, 700 c. Really, I mean, it's 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 but, at a thousand cc's a liter. <clears throat> I don't really see going on bypass but, that quickly. I don't really see the physiologic downside to it that you all are addressing here. I don't think it's really been studied. I don't think that that I'm aware of, and I don't really have any data in front of me to support that. But I know that in in my opinion, and this is strongly my opinion that RAP as a procedure should be abandoned. I don't think it should be performed by anybody. I don't think it makes any sense whatsoever. I think it makes more sense to ultrafiltrate the patient, have the ultrafiltrator always readily available, go ahead and go on bypass, on, especially on the unstable patients or the very sick patients, because you get them supported right away. I think that the incremental change in the hematocrit from either going on with uh, wrap or going on post wrap or going on with uh, just your regular pump prime is in uh, in my opinion insignificant. Again, not studied. Great study to have done. Hopefully, mm -hmm. we have some academia people yeah. <clears throat> that may be watching, whether on YouTube or Facebook this morning, who can look at that. Maybe that's something they can do. But I think that just for the sake of eliminating a liter's worth of prime in a transient situation for two or three minutes, the wrap carries with it too much risk, in my opinion, mm -hmm. for the potential benefit. And that's my opinion. Well, yeah. let's delineate what are the risks of RAP. It, the first one is air entrainment on the arterial side. If you if you arterial RAP. Yes. And then what the other risks are? Lack of perfusion secondary to having inadequate blood pressure by overpressing the patient. But then again, you were talking no. about transient, a transient, uh, uh, you know, event. Right, but Where again, I, mean, I don't know again, which is worse. Yeah. Is it which worse? Is worse? Which is worse? Yeah. And, but but I, you know, in, intuitively, I don't think having an SVR of three thousand is good for anybody. I think it constricts. It doesn't just constrict your radial artery, right. where you have, but it constricts your 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 renal arteries. It constricts your mesenteric artery. Yeah. I mean, how many patients have we seen with uh, dead bowel because of uh, excessive use of pressors? Now, I don't think that's going to happen in this circumstance. Right. But my my what what I'm trying to say is I don't know which one is better and which mm -hmm. one is worse because there's no good data to really look at. But I do know that I have strong opinion yeah. about it and anecdotal um, experience, and that tells me this is better yeah. than that. So I, I I'd don't like wrap to uh, bring up one more point before yeah. I hang up, Joe. Um, so. I know we're talking RAP versus hemoconcentration, but in a lot of situations, it's RAP or nothing because our surgeons don't want us to hemoconcentrate. They want the patient's kidneys to work on their own. So if we don't wrap and get that initial volume off, I do think that we're stuck with that volume and that would wrapping would be a better choice. Well, you just brought up another, you just threw out another point, of course, and, and that's, it's it. The surgeons want the kidneys to work on their own. I, I don't even know how that makes any sense. If you're going to wrap, then you're not providing them any, any, any fluid load at all. Fluid challenge to 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 stimulate the kidneys to want to pee. You're also creating a relative hypovolemia, albeit for a transient period of time, which of course makes the kidneys stop working. And I don't. There is absolutely zero evidence. In fact, there's evidence, quite a lot of evidence to the contrary, that ultrafiltration does not decrease urine output. Look, right, right now you're, you're, that's true. I've read CRRT. those studies. So, that's true. yes. So, 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 I mean, that, that's almost a, you know, bordering on a, a non-argument argument. So, but we're also increasing our viscosity if you're taking away that liter of volume that we were just pushed off. Well, that's true too. So basically, so, we have not. So, so I mean, we, we can argue this this, we this start whole over. time. We, I mean, we should, yeah. I mean, we're, we're zero, zero. But we also, you know, also the surgeon looks and turns to us and says, like, you know, hemodilution is your problem. You right. Know? 
So, so I'm trying to figure out a way, a cheap way, a cheap way uh -oh. to, oh, that's all right. A, a cheap way to, to take off this volume. And, you know, maybe there is a, you know, perfusion group or, or company that doesn't believe in hemo concentration or just finds it, you know, expensive or doesn't feel that yeah, this, this needs to be within the circuit because of, you know, inflammatory responses or adding just to the overall cost of the circuit. It decreases inflammatory response. But, it de I mean, ultrafiltration yeah. but, removes inflammatory mediators. But I'm talking about just, excuse me, sur, uh, SIRS. Yes. We're talking about SIRS. So we're talking about like a surface a surface inflammatory response. Oh, okay. so, just, so you're increasing but, your surface area. You're increasing your is, surface okay. area, thus, yes, yeah, in hemocompatibility, you know, type tubing. But, you know, it, I don't need a surgeon to be saying like, hey. Your call has been forwarded uh, to an automated. Let's leave I don't need a surgeon to turn around and say like, hey. Why did you just push this? It's your fault. This this hemodilution is happening, but your call I only has gave been forwarded. This, this liter versus, like, say, anesthesia giving you know two liters prior to bypass. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's sometimes it sometimes it can be my fault. I will take I will take fault if if I you know don't take care of uh, fluid management. But ultimately, ultimately. The surgeon looks at us and says, "Like, hey, you got to take care of this hemodilution." Yeah, but there's, I and mean, there's an old saying: you can't make chicken soup out of chicken stuff. You know what? Excrement. And yeah, that too. Yes. And so, you know, hemodilution is our problem. That's true. But if the patient's hematocrit coming into the room is 26, and right. their their anesthesia gives uh, two right. liters of fluid over the course of the time that they're intubating the patient and getting right. the mammary down. I mean, the, the patient's getting blood. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you can avoid blood transfusion that way. No, I, I agree. I but mean, I think we've done, can, I think we've done our due diligence. It, but I don't think we can just eliminate, eliminate transfusions. Right. Say, you know, because of either RAP or ultrafiltration. Right. right. Sometimes I agree. you just have it a very unique I agree. patient. And you have to but, get blood transfusions. Yeah. But, you know, you, you asked the question of, like, you know, are, are you going to wrap that 20% EF? You know, that, that train. I wouldn't. I, you know, and it's funny. I did. You I didn't. did. And what I found in, in most cases, I did have plenty of volume because they were fluid resuscitated. Right. That's They're true. They're fluid resuscitated. Probably I, fluid and, overloaded. Yes. Already. Absolutely. Already. And, you know, if, if, if that leader didn't go into that patient, well, there's a little bit less to hemoconcentrate. I mean, I would use both. I mean. It, again, this is the perfusion's toolbox. I, I'm not against hemofiltration by, by any means. I mean, I just, I, I believe in rap. <laughs> mm. so, so Kimberly, Kimberly Miller says, but if you prevent even one unit of RBCs, is it worth the risk of rap? And a transfusion has more detrimental effects yes. than a possible risk of rap. So, Kimberly, I, 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 I agree with your statement, but again, I, the, the, for me, the argument is not the transfusion, because when we go on bypass, I can remove as much fluid as I need to before I do that first blood gas and see what the hematocrit is, so long as I have adequate flow and all of that kind of thing. So, you know, I, you're removing it beforehand, creating this, not, not giving it to the patient. I'm giving it to the patient, but removing it in a very short period of time. And I think where this circle argument exists is we don't know which one has more risk or more benefit on either side of this uh, 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 issue. I think that if it were a matter of what Stephanie was saying is that, you know, if you don't have ultrafiltration as an option, at all, and you give, uh, you're going to wrap the patient to avoid a transfusion. In that case, yes, I think wrap has, uh, is a better option than giving that unit, committing to giving that unit of blood to that patient. So I agree with that, that blood transfusions are inherently bad and we want to avoid them. However, still necessary. We right. cannot eliminate blood transfusions Absolutely. in cardiac surgery, right. not gonna happen. But if you have a choice between RAP and ultrafiltration, I feel like the risk of RAP versus the transient 
additional hema dilution of my circuit while I remove that from the ultrafiltrator um, is not as good, that the ultrafiltration is better. And that's my argument, my esteemed colleagues here at the panel and apparently you too, and everybody Stephanie else that's called in, in and everybody the rest of the world in. feels that I'm, you know, the, uh, the second coming. It, and uh, it'd be um, great to hear from somebody who's on your side. Yes. You know, if there's anybody yeah. well, out there, you know, nobody's going to present an argument. Nobody's which, calling to be on my which side. Which is actually quite <laughs> funny because I find more perfusionists against the uh, uh, rap. You, you, you know? That, yeah. I, I, that I know of. I mean, yeah. I, I practice in Tuscaloosa for a short period of time, and, and that perfusionist was against rap, which was quite interesting. Um, to me because, you know, again, I, I've been doing it for so long that it's just, it's second nature to me. It's me talking to the surgeon, me you talking about Mark? to you. Mark was against right. rap? Yes. I knew, I, Mark, I know you're probably Mark is probably right now, asleep. He's Mark, on mountain time. He's on mountain time. But Mark, I, I knew there was a reason why we had such a close yes. affinity to our yes. set, to each other. Yes. What, what were his reasons for being against? It, the same as Joe's. It's, okay. it, it's, it's a risk benefit type thing to him. But when I did this where I practiced, practiced before in Detroit, we actually watched, I personally watched these patients from pre-op all the way to discharge. And I watched their blood product utilization from the ICU and on. And I found that we reduced our blood product usage because of all of our different techniques with, with fluid management and adding wrap into their, into the actual uh, blood conservation plan did actually show that, you know, it, hey, this is, this is an actual legitimate uh, procedure to perform. Mm -hmm. and, and this was against off-pump surgeons. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, yeah. surgeons who, you know, don't use our cardiopulmonary bypass circuit you know, they're not seeing this quote unquote liter of volume, 1200, whatever it is your prime volume is. So we actually found that they were giving more blood products than our cardiopulmonary bypass patients. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that is quite interesting. I don't have that data, but you know, I, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's institutional data that I'm sure they don't want to share, but you know, I, I, I took care of that data, and I saw it, okay. so, and I Very recorded good. it. Well, I think that we're, uh -huh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm getting a five-minute warning signal here, so uh, I think what we're going to do is, unless there's any other questions, let's, let's uh, how about if we go to commercial break? We're going to take about five minutes, maybe, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to hit it with Rodell's presentation on how low can we go on the hemoglobin, optimizing the hemoglobin for our, our, our patients. I think this is gonna be a very informative